Today we're going to start chapter 11 on, as I was just telling you, differential equations. Chapter 11, differential equations. We have talked about differential equations a tiny bit in this course. You may not remember it. But back when we were talking about integration, I talked about them a little bit. A subtopic that we're going to do is vectors. The book doesn't really emphasize vectors. But I think it's a worthwhile sub subtopic to bring in while you talk about differential equations, including right away here. Though mostly when we talk about vectors, it's going to be later. Last week of class or so is going to be the main place where we talk about vectors. And I think it's best to introduce differential equations by talking about examples. So here's an important example from physics. Free fall. Initially, we'll do it without air resistance because that's simpler. But I think I would like to try to get some air resistance related models into this. And that'll definitely help those of you who take either differential equations with linear algebra or the plane differential equations class next year. But we'll start without air resistance. It'll be a pretty good model of up down motion of an object like a, a ball near the surface of the earth. If it's a hard object like a ball or a rock or something like that, not so good if it's a feather or a leaf. Though theoretically, it's good even for a feather or a leaf if somehow you were inside a vacuum chamber, there was no air resistance. Let's just pretend we've got a ball here. There's a ball. It only feels, if we're assuming no air resistance without, this is a without here, without air resistance. If there's no air resistance, there's only the force due to gravity, which is a vector. pointing straight downward toward the, toward the center of the Earth, really. Not the surface of the Earth, because the surface could be slanted, right? You could be on a mountain. It's going toward the center of the Earth, though we'll go ahead and assume we're on a flat, flat ground. Force to gravity, you can label that F sub grav. I'll use a little half arrow above the vector, to, the symbol to represent it as a vector. F sub grav for the force due to gravity. Before we write down an equation for this force due to gravity, we should pick a positive direction, either upward or downward. It doesn't really matter which one you do. It's a bit more traditional to do upward. Upward is the positive y direction, say, and probably it would make the most sense to also put y zero, y equals zero to be ground level. This is the ground here, say. Though you don't have to. You could do some other location as y equals zero. It's really arbitrary. You also could take the positive or y direction to be downward, either way. You just got to pick a coordinate system and you got to stay consistent with it. This is the more natural thing to do, perhaps. Once I've set up my coordinate system, I can write down an equation for the force due to gravity. Sometimes it's written as m times g vector with a negative sign. Well, OK. Actually, let's do it with a positive sign. I actually did not do that in the first class. However, in the next equation, I'm going to write a negative sign. m is the mass of the ball. g is a vector pointing downward whose length is 9.8, say. Pointing downward, though, is why I have to label it as a vector, and so I put a little half arrow above it. However, more typically what you do is you put in a negative mg without a vector symbol above the g, and instead put a j hat here. What's J hat? I did talk about it back near the beginning of the course, first couple of weeks. Well, I hat, remember, is a unit vector, vector of length one pointing directly to the right when you're drawing on a two-dimensional piece of paper. 
and J hat points straight upwards on paper or in actual physical space straight upwards, J hat is unit length pointing straight upwards. The magnitude of this vector, how long it is, is mg without a negative sign. Because j hat points upward, I need a negative sign here so that this vector points downward. Putting a negative sign in front of the vector makes it point in the opposite direction. Vectors are thought of as arrows that represent physical quantities that have a direction, a strength or magnitude and a direction. The force due to gravity has a strength or a magnitude and a direction downward. The magnitude is m times g, where g is in standard units, SI units, 9.8 meters per second squared, and m is the mass of the ball in kilograms. And you can think of the units of this as being newtons. G is, it's good to leave it as a general G instead of substituting 9.8 because this does apply to other situations like the moon. I don't remember exactly what G is on the moon. It's one something meters per second squared. I don't remember for sure, maybe 1.3 or something meters per second squared on the moon. It's also not 9.8 if you're up on the top of a very large mountain like Mount Everest. It's a little smaller, maybe 9.7 or something. If you go even higher into the stratosphere, say 20 miles up, it might be 9.5 meters per second squared. It's not actually constant. It's just approximately constant near the surface of the Earth. If you're out in outer space, is it zero? Uh, technically not, unless you're really far away from the Earth, then it's effectively zero. If you're in deep space, So why do we say astronauts are, are, are weightless in space? They experience weightlessness because of, of the fact that they are in space and they're also going around the Earth. That's enough to give them the experience of weight, weightlessness. If you actually stop the spaceship somehow, so it's not going around the Earth, but is directly above some spot in the Earth, it would actually follow the Earth. It's only the fact that it's got a large positive velocity of something like 20,000 miles an hour that it keeps going around and around the Earth. In fact, do you ever see that guy, like I think it was like seven or eight years ago, who took a balloon up to the edge of space and skydived? Don't do it without training because he, he was spinning really fast. It was hard to get control. You can skydive from the edge of space. You got to wear a spacesuit. But you'd, you'd fall toward the Earth. Um, you know, he's spinning kind of fast, going really fast. Then he's, he slows down because he's there's more friction with the atmosphere as the atmosphere gets thicker and thicker as he's falling further and further. So he actually slows down and heats up. And it was really hard for him to get stabilized so that he didn't pass out. Um, though I suppose if the, if the parachute was programmed to deploy at a certain time, maybe it wouldn't matter. But you know, you wouldn't want to pass out as you're falling toward the Earth anyway. Anyway, that's a side light. What do we want to do now? We want to come up with what's called the equation of motion. What you need to use is Newton's second law. Newton's second law, typically written as F equals MA, in general, it's a vector equation. Vector F equals the mass times vector A, where A is the acceleration vector. Go ahead and replace the force with what it equals here. It's just the force due to gravity. If we allowed air resistance, which we will here eventually, maybe next week, if we allowed air resistance, I need to add an air resistance force to this and sum those two forces to get the total force. And the air resistance force is more complicated than the gravitational force. The gravitational force is a constant vector pointing straight down, it doesn't change. The air resistance force changes. It changes both length and direction. If the object's going upward, if the ball is moving upward, like I throw it really hard at first, or I shoot out of the cannon straight upward at first, 
the air resistance is very large in the negative direction. As it slows down, it gets smaller and smaller, shorter and shorter vector in the negative direction. And then as the ball falls toward the Earth, the air resistance points upward. It's always against the velocity. It's in the opposite direction of the velocity. And the faster and faster the ball goes, the longer the air resistance vector gets. It's proportional to the velocity in the, and in the opposite direction. At least the simplest model is it's proportional to the velocity. Simplest model is not necessarily the most accurate though. We might need to adjust that model if we want more accuracy. <clears throat> but you always start simple when you're doing mathematical modeling. We're trying to start as simple as we can here. So go ahead and make that replacement. And let me also put the MA on the other side. We can cancel the Ms, that's nice. So I get the vector A, the acceleration vector is negative G times J hat. Again, no vector in, on top of the J of the G there because it's negative G times J hat that is the vector. It's a scalar multiple of the J hat vector. The G is its length. So take J hat and scale it up by 9.8, make it 9.8 times longer. And then the negative sign turns it around so it points straight down. This is called the equation of motion. Equation of motion. And this is the simplest, relatively realistic example of an equation of motion. The equation of motion is actually a differential equation in disguise. Now, the word differential does make you think calculus. We use the word differential and derivative somewhat synonymously, as if they are synonyms. They're not really synonyms. Derivative refers more to deriving uh, an f prime from an f. It's a function that's derived from the original function. Differential is typically a word reserved more for symbols like dy or dx or dt. Those are often called differentials. I haven't really emphasized that, but that's true. But effectively, we can effectively think of them as synonyms, differential versus derivative. Differential equations do involve derivatives. Wait, I don't see any derivative there. Well, it's in disguise. The acceleration is a derivative. It's the derivative of the velocity because it's the rate of change of the velocity. That's the definition of what, accel what acceleration is. Instantaneous rate of change of velocity. Nine point, if you're thinking scalar, 9.8 meters per second squared means 9.8 meters per second per second. It's telling you how fast the velocity is changing. Every second that goes by, the velocity increases by 9.8 meters per second. Hey, yeah, that's a derivative. There's a differential equation. This equation right there is what you would call a, a first order, first order differential equation. Let me add the word vector in there in parentheses, first order vector differential equation or diffy q for short. Equations are often affectionately called diffy cues. They're also sometimes called ODEs. ODEs if they involve ordinary derivatives and PDEs if they involve partial derivatives. But we'll just call them diffy cues. What's the first order mean? It means it involves a first derivative. First derivative of some unknown function. The velocity is an unknown function of time. I also could write it as a second order differential equation because the velocity is the derivative of the height, the position. 
y. So the velocity is dy dt, so its derivative is really the second derivative of the height of the position as a function of t. Now I used y as being the height here effectively, but I'm not treating y as a vector, I'm treating it as a scalar quantity. More commonly, people use the letter R for position as a vector. The equality between this and this, that would be a second order vector Diffie Q. I can think of the equation of motion in either way. It's okay, either way. I'm probably most interested ultimately in knowing the position, which means I would wanna know the height. That's probably of most interest because for example, that would help me figure out what's the maximum height, figure out when is the ball gonna hit the ground, that kind of thing. And we will plug in numbers here eventually. These are vector, this is our vector differential equations. Can I convert them to scalar differential equations? Yeah. D vector t, d vector v dt could be thought of as a scalar derivative of a scalar velocity times j hat. What's the difference there? The difference is I'm thinking of this thing, that dvdt as just being a, a numerical quantity that could be positive or negative. If I multiply times j hat, that unit vector that points straight upwards, that creates what's called a vector quantity that is an arrow. It's not a ton of distinction between these ideas if we're talking a one dimensional scalar quantity versus a one dimensional arrow that either goes up or down. Not really a ton of distinction between those ideas, but you can make a distinction. And we also could write the second derivative of the position vector with respect to time as the second derivative of the height with respect to time. I'm using different letters here. Don't let that bother you. I could have used the same letter. <clears throat> I'm using a Y here because it's traditional to think of the vertical direction as the Y direction. And I'm using an R here because it's traditional to think of label position vectors with an R. That's, that's all I'm doing. Don't think of it as a big deal. It will give me the flexibility, if I think about it in terms of vectors, to allow for more than up-down motion, to allow for projectile motion that goes left to right as well, as well as up and down. It'll give me flexibility if I want to do that, that. And I think we will do that eventually here, just not right away. I'm going to, I'm going to aim to at least. Using those conventions, I can effectively get rid of the j-hat. I can convert these vector equations to scalar equations. Scalar differential equations. A second order and a first one, order one. I can effectively write the same equation where I get rid of j hat and get rid of the vector symbols and make the r become a y. So I can write the second derivative of y with respect to t twice equals the first derivative of v with respect to t equals negative g. I got rid of the j hat, I got rid of the vector symbols, and I changed the r to a y. <clears throat> I can do that if it's one dimensional motion. Projectile motion in two dimensions, I'd want to think in terms of vectors. But let's avoid it here. What do you want to do with this? You want to solve it. That's what you want to do. Let's take this form of it. How do you solve a differential equation? 
What does it mean to solve a differential equation? First of all, what does it mean to be a solution? It's a really important analogy. Algebra equations, take a simple one like x squared equals 25, have solutions that are numbers. If x squared equals 25, that means x is plus or minus five. Those are the two numerical solutions of the algebra equation x squared equals 25. Differential equations have solutions that are functions, not numbers. Functions. Plus or minus five satisfy x squared equals 25. I'll go ahead and write it over here. X equals plus or minus five solve x squared equals 25 because, sorry about that, when you substitute them into the equation in place of x, it works, right? Five, this is sense, five squared is 25 and negative five squared is 25. Substituting them satisfies the equation. No other numbers work. Four squared is not 25. Negative 17 squared is not 25. The imaginary unit I squared is not negative 25. Not, not 25, that's what I meant to say. X equals four does not solve X squared equals 25 since four squared is not 25, it's 16. Likewise, with a differential equation, I'm after a function or functions, solutions that solve the equation, meaning I'm after V as a function of T, according to the symbols here, whose derivative is always negative G. Find a function whose derivative with respect to T is always negative G, negative 9.8, if you're near the surface of the Earth. What do you do? You can guess. Negative 9.8t works. So does negative 9.8t plus 5. What am I doing in guessing? It's a word that starts with an I. I'm integrating. Integrate. Integrate. V is an integral of negative g with respect to t. Question? <clears throat> um, yeah, I think, I mean, you were hinting at something there that is relevant. Like to solve, solve this equation, effectively we take the square root of both sides, we apply the inverse function of x squared. To solve a differential equation that involves a derivative, we're integrating. Inverse functions, that's right. Yep, yep, inverse functions or inverse processes, you might say differentiation versus integration. It's not always quite so simple though. Okay, and that's why the subject is wor a worthwhile subject in its own right is in the non-simple cases. Here in this simple case, we just integrate and get GT plus C, negative GT plus C. This is a general solution of the differential equation, the Diffie Q, dv dt equals negative g. General solution. The g, careful here, the g is a specific constant. It has to match the g that's up there. The c, is an arbitrary constant. It can be anything. <clears throat> you can always check it by differentiation. Very simple here. dv dt, differentiate this with respect to t, you get negative g. There we go, that's it for all t. Doesn't matter what T is, 
that derivative is constant. This equation is satisfied when I plug in this function. Any other function you plug in won't work. Side calculation here is some other function like v equals t squared or something will not work. Even if I put a g in there somehow, <coughs> even a negative g. Negative g t squared doesn't work. Why? Its derivative is negative 2g t, not equal to negative g as a function of t. <coughs> It would be equal if t is one half, but I would want them to be equal no matter what t is, and they're not. My water's very low. Can I make it through class? One, one sip there. <sighs> feels almost too simple maybe maybe or maybe it's still confusing to you how about if, can i solve the second order equation the second derivative of y with respect to t equaling negative g sure integrate twice we already integrated once integrate once and got that. And I could think of that as part of my work here. I could think, because I could think of V as dy dt. And then we integrate a second time, integrate again or integrate twice, integrate again. y is going to be the integral of this thing, negative gt plus c dt. Mm, we're going to get another integration constant. So maybe I should call this one c1. And the integration constant that I get here is going to be called c2. Integrate that with respect to t, you're going to get something that should look kind of familiar. Negative g over 2 t squared plus c1 t plus c2. This is a negative g over 2 here. And if g is 9.8, you're near the surface of the earth. g over 2 is 4.9. This would be negative 4.9 t squared. C1 and C2 could be anything. These are general solutions. However, in almost all practical problems, you're going to want to figure out what C1 and C2 are. And that's going to depend on initial conditions. If you're given an initial velocity, V of zero is the initial velocity. Say two meters per second, which is actually a pretty small initial velocity, right? If you throw the ball straight up, probably if you got a good arm, it's gonna be going, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 meters per second. Two meters per second is a pretty small push actually. It slows down very rapidly, so it doesn't go very much higher. But this is the number I used in the first section, so I'll use it again. And y0 is going to be the initial height. Let's say that's three meters. So that's, you know, I'm about two meters tall. If I put my hand up here, maybe that's close to three meters. Got the ball in my hand, and I give it a, a little push upward. Two meters per second. 
I can use these values to find the C1 and the C2. That's the initial velocity. This is negative G times zero plus C1, which is C1 using the velocity equation. This is the initial height. This is negative G over two times zero squared plus C1 times zero plus C2, which is just C2. So based on these initial conditions, the actual velocity is negative GT plus two and the actual height is y equals negative g over 2t squared plus 2t plus 3. And g is fixed, say it's 9.8. These are two specific functions called particular solutions of not just the differential equation, but also satisfying these initial conditions. Mean, that means they solve something called an initial value problem, initial value problem, IVP. I'm not going to write that down. I'll write it down on Wednesday because I forgot to write it down in the first section. So I'm not going to write it down for you guys too. But I'll say it is initial value problem, particular solutions of the initial value problems, whether it's the first order or second order. And let's go ahead and solve a particular problem now, a particular application. Maybe you want to find the maximum height. To find the maximum height, the method is to figure out the time when it reaches the maximum first. When it's at the highest point, at that instant in time, the velocity is zero. And you can solve for t. Let's go ahead and use g equals 9.8, so we're near the surface of the Earth. Set that equal to zero, solve for t. You'll get t is two over 9.8, which simplifies to about 0 0.204 seconds is the time when the maximum height is reached, which is very fast, about that fast, like that. That's about 0.2 seconds, say, between my snaps. And the maximum height itself then is going to be y of 0.204 approximately. G is 9.8, g over 2 is 4.9. So we get negative 4.9 times 0 0.204 squared plus 2 times point two times 0 0.204, that's supposed to be a time there, plus three, it's just gonna be a little bit bigger than three. It's not gonna go very high. Negative 4.9 times 0 0.204 squared plus two times, I did the same mistake in my calculator, two times, 0.204 plus three, about 3.204 meters is the maximum height. How accurate this is depends on how much air resistance there is. What about when the ball hits the ground? And the ball is not going very fast for one thing. So there's not much air resistance. This is probably pretty accurate. Hitting the round, we got to set y equal to zero and solve for t. So I'll use the y equation, negative 4.9t squared plus 2t plus three equals zero. To solve that by hand, you'd want to use the quadratic formula. T equals negative two plus or minus square root. Two squared is four minus four times negative 4.9 times three, all divided by 
two times negative 4.9, right? That's just the quadratic formulas all I'm using there. <clears throat> Actually, the first part here, negative two all over two times negative 4.9, we've already done that simplifies to two over 9.8. That's 0 0.204 the time of the maximum height, plus or minus something. Thing under the square root is gonna be four plus, two negatives make a plus, 12 times 4.9, right? Four times three times 4.9, plus sign because the two minuses make a plus. That's what I have to take the square root of divide by negative 9.8. This becomes negative 0 0.809 approximately. I could combine the plus minus of a negative as a minus plus if I want, but it's not a big deal. Just take the one that's positive, the positive root It's going to be 0 0.204 plus 0 0.809. Yeah, I already did that for this first part, but not for the second part. Looks like it's about 1.01. 1 .01. That's the time it hits the ground. Okay, so it's, I'm giving it a little push from right about here. In about one second, 1001, that's when it hits the ground. Okay, that would be a practical application. 